I'd like to tell you a story. Not a story of dragons, orcs, or magic rings, though that's certainly what I'm best known for these days. My name is John Ronald Ruel Tolkien. However, you most likely know me best as J.R.R. Tolkien. And this is the story of the Tea Club Barovian Society, or as we called ourselves, the TCBS. Christopher Wiseman. Not only was he a brilliant mathematician with a mind sharp enough to pierce steel, he was also my oldest and dearest friend. Through thick and thin, year after year, we stuck together like paste to parchment. Robert Quilter Gilson. One of the most quick-witted men I ever knew, and if I do say so, quite a gifted artist with an eye for detail. I dare say the man could give you the exact number of hairs on the Mona Lisa's head if you asked. In fact, he'd probably do it whether you asked or not. Jeffrey Barksmith. This young man entered our little ensemble of nutters a little while after the rest of us. His mind, though certainly sharp, was more attuned to the poetic. It was he who helped broaden our minds to just how timeless and beautiful poetry could be. Then, of course, there was myself. Together we made up the Tea Club Barovian Society, named so for our little meetings in the upstairs of Barrow's department store. Whatever force united us, two things tied us together. A love of literature and language. In fact, I would sometimes recite from a few of my favorite old English works, such as Beowulf. Then strode he through the deadly reek, his head armed for war to the succor of his lord. And these brief words he spake, Beowulf, beloved, do all things well unto the end, even as thou didst vow aforetime in the days of youth, that thou wouldst not, while living, suffer thy honor to fall low. Now, must thou, brave in deeds, thy noble heart unwavering, with all thy might, thy life defend. To the uttermost I will aid thee. Well, I'd say that's a fair place to finish for now. Very nice, John Lund. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, anything else you care to talk about? We've got plenty of time. Um, I've been revising a bit of my poetry. Uh, indeed. Well, let's see what you have. No, no, no. It's... It's not ready. It, it needs more... Needs more what? Flair, finesse, panache... I'm not sure, but whatever it is, it needs more. Well, why not just give us a part of what you have? You can't chop it up into bits and bobs. That's not how it works. Would you hang a painting before it's completed? No. When I'm finished with it, then you lot can hear it in its entirety. Very well, Geoffrey. Well, Robert, Christopher, anything to add to the common fund? Actually, I was hoping one of you would have something to discuss. Quite frankly, it's kind of dull out of a week. Aside from my studies, not a fair lot had. Nothing? Cots, well, there must be something. I'm afraid I've got nothing, Ronald. Most of my week has been quite par for the course. I'm rather gobsmacked, Christopher. Since when have you been short of conversation? You're usually a wellspring of enlightenment. More like a fountain of useless information, really. <laughs> <laughs> Come now, there must be something you wish to talk about, anything. Well, if you'd really like something to discuss... I would indeed. All right, enlighten us. What, pray tell, is the meaning of life? Ooh, Ooh. there's the question of the day. Coming out of the gate rather strongly, aren't we, Christopher? You asked for a contribution. I delivered as requested. Very well, oh, and do take notes. You've been in lectures all day, John Ronald. Try to keep it brief. I'll try to do so, as brief an answer as one can give to such a broad question. We're waiting. Right. It's fairly straightforward from my perspective, but I believe the answer to the question of our purpose on this earth is based in faith. The chief purpose of life for any of us, Christopher, is to increase our knowledge of God by all the means we have. One must remember that a life without Christ is one leading solely to emptiness. Nothing is achieved by our own doings aside from sinfulness or a desire to further our own prideful nature. But only through God is one able to live a life 
of substance. For in him all things were created. That includes us. Were it not for him, we would not be here having this meeting. Thus, whatever the paths we take in life, it is important that we lead lives worthy of his children. That, my dear Christopher, is our purpose on this earth. Very well said. I should say that my answer would be something along those lines. Well put. I'm surprised you kept your answer under an hour. <laughs> Robert, would you care to partake in the conversation or are you quite content with the company of your sketchbook? Hmm? Care to show us what you're working on? So I certainly, as a matter of fact, it's just about finished. Hmm? Hmm? Well, what do you think? I think you're daft as a bush. <laughs> All jokes aside, as a matter of fact, I wanted to talk about uh, that we discussed the Anglo-Saxon roots of Beowulf today in class. Hmm. My friend Richard asked why we study a language that the common folk don't even understand and much harder less speak. And what may I ask did you tell him? I asked him, why do we study men like Michelangelo and Da Vinci if no one lives who knew them in person? Language is much like a man. If his memory fades into obscurity, it becomes debatable whether it existed or not. Much like language. I admit, I don't understand a fraction as much as yourself about the old English language. But if everyone were to forget about it, texts like Beowulf would be, might as well have been written in complete gibberish. Or oh, Nevbosh. Come again. Oh, nothing, just talking to myself. But I completely agree. Language is intrinsically tied to life. I would go so far as to say we have a responsibility to make sure that these languages are not lost to time. Of course, no one wants to end up like William Saxley III. Who's William Saxley III? Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, where do you all see yourselves in 15 years? Beg your pardon. What makes you ask this? It's just... Our discussion of life and, and purpose. I have interests and passions, but recently I've been told by my father that I should consider a more viable profession. He kept using that word, viable, as if to say, poetry alone will not put a roof over your head. I know he means well, but it just makes me wonder about my future. Where will I be in 15 years? So, what about you lot? Well, I suppose I could see myself teaching. Possibly arithmetic. <laughs> Maybe even music. I can almost guarantee there'd be ample opportunity for employment. Myself, personally, I think I could put my skills to use in architecture. Perhaps designing new and useful products. There's no reason to believe why I couldn't continue to foster my passions at home as well as at work. What do you think, Joe Robert? Where will you be in 15 years? I hadn't often thought of that before. As a child, 15 years always seemed so far off. Yet here I was, 22 years of age, and... Looking back, those years seemed to pass me by as quick as the flame burns from a match. Still, I gave as best an answer as I could. Well, hopefully in 15 years I'll be living a steady life in the countryside with a good, well-paying job and my lovely Edith by my side. Oh, that's right. You fancy her terribly, don't you? Tell me, does she prattle on as much as you? If you think I'm going to discuss a woman of such grace with you, daughter in law I do believe you've lost your mind. <laughs> Are you sure? Perhaps you could recite a soliloquy in Old English to us about how you want to lock lips with her. You know, with wit like that, it's a wonder why you two don't have women to call your own. Oh, and dressing the dog in mother's frock doesn't count, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded now why we don't discuss matters of the fairer sex. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. These men truly were my best friends. I could discuss almost anything with them. As with all friends, you often wanted to strangle them as much as embrace them. And yet I wouldn't have traded my kinship with them for any dragon's hoard of gold. 
ever since the death of my mother. The Tea Club Barovian Society had become my home away from home. My sanctuary. Never before had I met three men of such sophistication, refinement, and merit. Oh! oh careful, it's hot. <laughs> well, gentlemen, it's getting rather late. Let's say we finish our pipes and call it an evening, eh? I suppose so. I've got some work to get to after all. Any plans for week's end, Robert? Indeed. I plan to visit a favorite spot of mine in the Great Haywood. Perhaps a bit of peace and quiet will give me the inspiration I need for my next piece. A bit of sunshine, fill the pipe, and no distractions from serene beauty. Jeffrey, what about you? What plans do you have? I have some thinking to do about my plans after university. Well, whoever our paths take us, May the TCBS be one of the few constants in our lives. No. <laughs> to the immortal four. The immortal four. I suppose. Ah, yes. Just a moment. Have you heard about the ruin? No. It's an old English Anglo Saxon poem. That's actually very ironic. And that it itself is a ruin. Yes, of course. Listen, Jack. I wouldn't fret about what you're going to do after university. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure what I'll be doing myself. But I know you. You have a sharp mind, and one that I know would suit you in whatever line of work you decide to pursue. Thank you, John Ronald. You may be right. With all that's going on in Europe at the moment, my family and I are already quite on edge. I suppose I may be overcomplicating things by worrying about it as much as I am. Well, you can't fret too much about the future. What happens will happen, and we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Of course. Good night, John. Good night, Jeffrey. Wonderful men, each of them. They would never know just how important they would become in my writing. But there was one who would inspire me far beyond what I imagined possible. My darling Edith. I looked upon her as a child looks at the stars in the night sky. Her beauty was beyond the finest gems on earth. Her very radiance made the moon's light pale in comparison. Whether I was happy or sad, just being in her company was enough to raise my spirits. Then. As well as can be, given the circumstances, they, like me, are still trying to figure some things out. World events have not been kind to anyone in this matter, though. Europe's political climate seems a bubble ready to burst. John Ronald, are you suggesting it may come to war? Well, there's always the possibility of that, given man's predisposition for violence. But I don't think it will come to that. Not for a long while, if it is to come. Britain, thus far, has remained relatively distant from the affairs of the rest of Europe. It truly is a mess, however. I'm worried, John Ronald. We're not going to worry about it right now. Besides, I have other matters on my hands. Much more important matters. Let's not focus on all that right now. Focus on the here and now, the you and I. Of course, we all knew that war would be a possibility. With things the way they were in Europe, it wasn't far from anyone's mind. But none of us thought that events would transpire as they did. How wrong we were. How wrong I was. Uh, 
owing to the summary rejection by the German government of the request made by His Majesty's government for assurances that the neutrality of Belgium would be respected. His Majesty's ambassador in Berlin has received his passport, and His Majesty's government has declared to the German government that a state of war exists between Great Britain and Germany, as from 11 p.m. on August 4th. I have just received from Minister of Foreign Affairs, that is the Belgian Minister of Foreign Affairs, a note of which the following is a literal translation. Belgian government regret to have to inform His Majesty's government that this morning armed forces of Germany penetrated into Belgian territory in violation of engagements assumed by the treaty. Gentlemen, I appreciate your consideration of moving our meeting to my home today. I, think I thought that a small Christmas meeting would give us a bit more privacy than Barrows, but with the holiday hustle and bustle. Of course, Christmas. Right. I would ask why spirits are so low around such a time of year, but I'm sure we're all away. War. All out war. How did it come to this? Do you care for the long answer or the short? I know how we got here, Geoffrey. It's just that I never thought that England would ever get itself wrapped up in something like this. The idea that this could happen, never in my lifetime would I ever believe that a war of this magnitude would ever be seen. It's unthinkable. Is it? As long as there are two men left in the world, one is going to want the other one dead. Mankind is always in search of new ways to conquer each other in pursuit of their own interests. War makes ill work of even the best men. Speaking of such matters. What is it, Christopher? I'm sure we're all aware that this is something that cannot be swept under the rug. The simple fact is, we are at war. As such, I've decided to enlist. Christopher, you're serious? You mean to enlist? Not lightly, but firmly. I've notified my family and my professors. I shall be off to basic training before too long. Goodness, you certainly thought this through. Infantry? Navy. It's a terrible thing that men must go to war. The idea that I may need to take another life I've struggled with the decision, but I have no doubt in my mind or in my heart that if I'm to die young, I will die in the service of England. That's quite noble, Christopher. Christopher, had you made this decision back in August or September, I wouldn't have questioned you, but this war has already escalated far beyond what we imagined. You're certain of this? I'm not entirely sure of anything at the moment. The idea of leaving home to partake in armed combat shakes me to my core. But the idea that the people I love could be at risk is more overwhelming. It's partially why I've called this meeting today. I'm not sure how often we'll be able to see each other after all this. Christopher, don't talk like that. I can't believe what I'm hearing. This is something of a bad dream. I'll do it. Jeffrey, what are you talking about? I'm going to enlist as well. Gracious! Has everyone's minds gone to pot? Do you understand how dangerous this decision is? I do understand, Robert. Do you take me for a fool? It's like Christopher said. The people we love are at risk. I'm not going to stand by and wait for things to escalate further. Tomorrow I'm going to the nearest recruitment office to enlist. I refuse to stand by as... Our country falls under the attack of evil men. You have to understand, Robert. England needs us. Everything we hold dear and our very way of life is at risk. You know this. You're right, Geoffrey. Terrible as it may be, I think we need to do this. I should go with you tomorrow to enlist. What do you think, John Ronald? You plan to enlist, I'm sure? No. 
No. You mean not to enlist. I mean not to enlist now. Well then, why this apprehension? Not that it's any matter of yours, but I'm deferring my service until I complete my education. Deferring your service? For your education? Have you gone deaf, John Ronald? You would sit on your hands and do nothing? Geoffrey, that's quite enough. Do forgive me, Geoffrey, but running off into the yonder and abandoning everything I've worked for and everyone I love only to end up in a shallow grave is not my idea of bravery. Nor do I find it particularly helpful to have my decision shamed by my friends. I don't believe what I'm hearing. Do you realize how selfish you sound? Now that's enough, Geoffrey. You shouldn't judge his decision based solely on your own view. Put yourself in his shoes. Put myself in his shoes? I am in his shoes! Robert is in his shoes! We are all in the same boat! England is at war! Men are fighting and dying! Good men are marching to the depths, and you're content to sit in your bed with your nose in your books while the world burns around you? John, if you have something to say to me, Geoffrey, I suggest you choose your next words very carefully. You want to know what I think? Gentlemen! Geoffrey, enough! You're only making matters worse! No! I'll say it! You've lost the plot, John Ronald! You have lost the plot! <laughs> Maybe you don't care what's going to happen, but the rest of us are going out there to defend our friends and family. All the while, you're going to go about your merry way under the shield of honorable men like an absolute coward! Now that's enough! We have enough problems as it is. We can do without two friends tearing each other to shreds. John Ronald, you know damn well what these men are fighting for and why they're leaving. And Jeffrey, John Ronald is certainly no coward. And I'm quite certain he's getting quite the talking to from common fools. He doesn't need the same talking to from any of us. You're right, Christopher. Forgive me, Jeffrey. I was out of line. No. No, it's, it's, it's my fault. Forgive me for the words I said, John Ronald. I would take them back. I just... I don't know what's going to happen. Conflict hasn't been seen on a scale like this in our lives, or, or arguably the lives of our parents. I'm enlisting for king and country, of course, but I'm shaken at the thought of leaving everything behind. Who knows where I'll end up? France? Belgium? All I know is I'll be farther away from home than I've ever wanted to be. Jeffrey, whatever plans God has for you and for I are his to know and his alone. Nothing we see is set in stone. Perhaps I too am afraid. There is still much I wish to accomplish. And if I am to die, I want to die feeling satisfied. Very well. I may not agree with you, John Arnold, but I know you have your reasons. It's not my place to shame you, and I apologize again for everything I said. There is nothing to forgive, Jeffrey. Robert. Are you okay? I... I'm fine. It's just... I dread to think what this war will make of us. All this waiting with the knowledge that waiting will not end the war makes us all ill-tempered to know that with or without us this war will continue. If there's one thing I know, it's that I'm haunted by the, by the fact that test is yet to come. Well, then let's not think of it. Not right now. It, it's Christmas after all. No one should be in such a somber mood at Christmas. Spot on, Christopher. And so we shall be. Come, gentlemen. We shall leave tomorrow until it arrives. It is Christmas after all. And we are among friends this Christmas season. That is so much more than many others can say. Well, gentlemen, anything to add to the common fund? I'm glad you asked. Do you remember that bit of poetry that I was having trouble on? Well, after quite a bit of revision and a touch of flair, finesse, and panache, you've finished it. Indeed I have. And if you gentlemen would indulge me, I would very much like it if you men were the first to hear it.
Of course. Whenever you're ready. There is a place where voices of great guns do not come. Where rifle, mine, and mortar forevermore are dumb. Where there is only silence and peace eternal and rest. Set somewhere in the quiet isles beyond death's starry west. To God, the God of battles, to us who intercede, give only strength to follow until there's no more need. And grant us at that ending of the unkindly quest to come unto the quiet isles beyond death's starry west. Jeffrey, that was marvelous. I dare say that may be some of the best you have written yet. Without a doubt. Thank you, gentlemen. You know what? Wait here. Jeffrey, would you mind going to the cabinet and grabbing those glasses? Of course. What could this be about? Oh, my. This is quite a surprise, Christopher. <laughs> Truthfully, my father was saving this for a special occasion. I see no more occasion more special than this. I propose a toast. Not only to our Savior's birth, but to the TCBS, the finest bunch of fruitcakes I've ever known. <laughs> here, here, here. <laughs> That evening, as bad as things were, even knowing that we may not see each other again after all this, the members of the TCBS still found themselves in high spirits. It's a night I will never forget, as long as I live. Happy Christmas, John Wolf. Happy Christmas, Jeffrey. The halls of the university were far less teeming than they had been a year prior. Including myself, only 25 students walked the halls. Each echoing footstep was a ringing bell in my ear, reminding me that more and more men were enlisting in the war each day. Christopher, Robert, and Geoffrey had all enlisted, and here I was preparing for exams. June came, however, and I passed my classes. Now, with my education completed, I had but one goal in mind before enlisting. Edith, I'm sure you're aware of my intentions to enlist. Yes, it's just, I'm worried for you. I don't want to lose you. I've put this off long enough, Edith. Every day I stay here, men are dying in service to the crown. And it's time I did my part. Tomorrow I'm going to the nearest recruiting office and signing up. But before I do, I have something I want to ask you. Of course, anything. If you need anything, I'm here for you. Edith Bratton, I cannot tell you what the future holds. And if I am to perish in the war, I wish to perish knowing that I have died in companionship with the one true love of my life. Edith Bratton, will you marry me? Of course I will, yes! I wish this day had come under happier circumstances. As do I. But all we can do right now is make the most of the time we have. I love you, Edith. I love you too, John Ronald. No man who enters the service is ever truly prepared for the toll it will take on him. Five months. Five miserable months. My service ended when I was struck ill. And yet the worst blow was yet to be dealt. 
the TCBS went into the war as a complete unit. I wish I could tell you that we left that way. You shouldn't be out of bed in your current state. Christopher. Good evening, John Ronald. Oh, careful, John. It's easy does it. Good. Ah, good. What are you doing here? Shore leave. I had to get off the water and onto land. Besides, I had to see how you were doing. I won't say that I'm well. My fever subsides and my strength returns. Such deep sadness. Robert. Robert. I was gutted upon hearing of his passing. As I knew you were from your letters to Geoffrey. <sighs> Geoffrey. I haven't heard from him since the letter he sent me. I had it read to me, but I was in no state of mind to... John. Christopher. John. I... Jeffrey died 13 days ago. His wounds, they are... John? Just like that, my heart had broken. Two of my closest friends, two young, beautiful souls, gone snatched from my life without a word without goodbye I had taken my worst blow not in my illness or in the trenches but here from the only close friend I had left oh, Christopher I know why why these men? What crime had they committed that they should be counted amongst the dead? Was it not enough for them to suffer the death and decay of their fellow men? Nothing, John Ronald, nothing. No one deserved any of this, least of all Rob and Geoffrey. And why? Why has God seen fit to take these men before their time? I fear your pain, John, I truly do. I've been thinking every day of these men. I ask myself why Rob and Jeffrey were taken from us. I would be lying if I said I had the answer. I feel torn, Christopher. I feel torn. As though a piece of my heart has been ripped right from my chest. So many things left unsaid. Futures shattered. Truly is a terrible thing that men must die. And yet when our day comes, it's always too soon. I do wish I could see Rob and Jeffrey one last time. But they are gone. Gone to the heavenly home, and I can only pray, Almighty God, that I am accounted worthy of them. It's finished then, isn't it? TCBS, our friendship, it's all over, isn't it? No. No, John Ronald. The TCBS is not finished and never will be. Rob and Jeffrey are gone. This is true. And this we cannot change. But these are matters not meant for us to decide. 
where we go now, what we do next, how best to use the time God has given us, this now, John, is what we are meant to decide. You're right, Christopher. You're right. This loss, I feel, shall not fade with time. But I cannot sit here and wallow in my sadness. Otherwise, what have these men died for? Robert and Geoffrey are gone. And they have earned their rest. But it is up to you and me to make sure their memories are not lost to the sands of time. No matter where we go, no matter what paths we take in life, we must carry the memories of these men with us. They will live on through us. The immortal four need not have died in the war. The TCBS lives. I have something else here for you. It was with Jeffrey's belongings. Most of his belongings are being returned to his family. But I feel as though this is something that should be passed on to a true member of the society. Jeffrey's poems. I figured that they'd give you comfort as they have given me in light of his passing. And comfort me they will. I will not let his words go unheard. Well, I must be off. Thank you, Christopher. And my constant companion for so long. Oh, how I can ever repay you. Well, I'm sure you'll think of something. Goodbye, John Holmes. Goodbye, Christopher. Dear John Ronald, My chief consolation is that if I am scuppered tonight, I am off duty in a few minutes, there will still be left a member of the great TCBS to voice what I dreamed and what we all agreed upon. For the death of one of its members cannot, I am determined, dissolve the TCBS. Death can make us loathsome and helpless as individuals, but it cannot put an end to the immortal four a discovery I am going to communicate to Rob before I go off tonight. And do you write it also to Christopher. May God bless you, my dear John Ronald, and may you say the things I have tried to say long after I am not there to say them, if such be my lot. Yours ever, Geoffrey. John, please, you should be resting. You need to worry about me, Edith. I feel my strength returning, and with you, my pain is soothed. And if you'll indulge me, I would like to do something with you tomorrow, just you and I. Are you certain? You still look a bit pale. I can withstand any illness with you by my side. Very well. Where would you like to go? If it's all the same with you, I would like to visit Great Haywood. Great Haywood? Are you certainly well enough? I'm well enough for a day with you. Very well. But only if you get some rest. I love you. I love you too, John Williams. How do you carry on when the life you once knew has been shaken to its very core? I would be lying if I said it was easy. The loss of those you love is a challenge that everyone is faced with. It's a part of life, but there is always a comfort to be found. Comfort in the arms of a lover or a friend. 
and an even greater comfort when one realizes that death is not the end of our journey. Rather, death is only a step out of the door into a new day. Dear Christopher, you remember that Jeffrey once asked us where we thought we would be in 15 years. Well, 16 years have passed since that day. I am most proud to say that I have found my calling, as I hope you have found yours. Teaching at Oxford has certainly gifted me with some of the most cherished experiences and memories of my life. And yet above any of these memories, I know I will cherish most of all the memories I made years ago with you, Robert, and Jeffrey, the immortal four of the TCBS. And though I miss my friends dearly, I know they would be proud to see what has become of us. Things haven't been the same since that Christmas evening. Robert's wit and smile are sorely missed. And Jeffrey, I think he would be most elated to know that his words did not go unheard. His poems are now able to be read by all, in a book of his own, a spring harvest by Jeffrey Boxsmith. If there is anything I'm certain of, it's that we are forever in the dark about our time on this earth. But this is all the more reason to spend what time we have with those who we love in the light of things that evil cannot touch. So go forth, tell your story. The world yearns for such tales to be told. And they will be.